Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit. We've been having you do a lot of activities and while you've been having fun doing it, it's also important for all of us to know where these uh, or the basis of these activities and why we chose to do these activities and not some others. There's a lot of research that has gone into this in the, over the past 50 to 70 years. And what I want to share with you is some of the principles that came out of all these decades of research. This is written in language that all of us can understand at this point. And let's spend a few minutes on each one of them and try to understand the implications. One of the first things is that students actively construct their own knowledge. And it sounds good, we all seem to agree with it, but it means that learning is not an information transfer process. As a teacher, I don't have knowledge that I can put into my hands or a medium, package it and transmit it to the learner. Instead, all I can do as a teacher is create an environment where the students put together the different pieces of knowledge on their own. And that's the most effective, or that's really the only way learning happens. Uh, the corollary to that is that students don't come in with blank minds, they're not blank slates. They have a lot of previous knowledge, experiences, because they're also human beings in this world. They've read things, they see things. So what people know, what students know, affects deeply how they learn and what they learn. And as teachers, we really need to keep that in mind when we design a lesson or when we think about teaching. And the third point I would like to make is that when we want effective learning to happen, it has to be in a given context. And I'd like to remind all of us about a point made right in the beginning. In fact, where somebody talked about real life applications. That's one of the consequences of this, that the more connected we try to make our concepts and theories to real life, then the learning is, it happens, it's more effective. In fact, the best forms of learning are, no, uh, they're said to be, they're called as situated learning, where the context in which the learning happens is exactly the context in which it's practiced. And what I mean is, uh, if you're a tailor, or let's say if there's somebody who wants to learn to be a tailor, they don't go to a tailoring school, or they might go a little bit, but then they go and become an apprentice, apprentice in a tailor's shop and learn on the job. So while we cannot go to that extreme, what we want to try to do is to keep the context in place when we are in our classroom. And finally, there's a point which, in fact, all of you have been experiencing right now in the past two hours, that learning is a social activity. We learn from each other, from peers, by talking, by doing things with each other. So as far as possible, we should try to include these activities in the classroom, these kind of processes. And that's exactly why we have, in this session, also included all these activities. So let's. Let, let me put a question to you now. How would you do this in when you're teaching CS101? So think about it for a minute or so. We have a question from VNIT Nagpur. My question is, how should be the assignment list? Is there any proper order or methodology to create assignment list the for students? The question is, uh, what should the assignment list be for students? So are you asking about assessment for students? Can you please clarify your question? Which assignment list? Assignment list for data structure or? How should be the assignment list? Is there any proper method or methodology to create a list? So the question is, is there a methodology to create an assignment list in a given topic? Um, so assessment, in fact, could be an entire three-hour session. And let me ask, are people from Mission 10X going to talk about assessment? Okay, probably not. Uh, yes. Hello. Hello. Hello, excuse me, ma'am. Yes, please. I just elaborate. Uh, what should be the what? What should be the portion? How, how much? Trace will be given on assignment like a what knowledge, application, like that. Uh, or introduction to the programming. So are you asking how, when you do assignments, we talked about different levels of questions like knowledge, comprehension, application, etc. So is your question how much of each to put in the questions and the assessment? Is that the question? Okay, that is in fact a very good and a very difficult question. 
And the reason is that there's no, well, there's no one definite answer. The, what they're trying to ask is, we talked about different levels, increasing levels of hierarchy. When should we, or how much of each level should we, should we include? I, I guess all we can talk about is some general guidelines. And typically what happens in college exams is that we focus too much on knowledge and comprehension maybe a little bit on application and almost none on design and evaluation. So the point of exposing all of us to these different levels is that there are all these levels that go much deeper than recalling facts. And we do need to think about these, we do need to include these in exams and assignments, etc. Now, this does not mean that we should completely neglect the lower level ones because they also have their place. And how much to include where is finally a teacher's call. It goes back to your learning objectives. It goes back to what you want the students to learn from that given topic or that given day. So this is a very broad, vague statement that I'm making. But that's really the best we can do. And for the same topic, different teachers might have different sets of questions. So the main point I want to leave you with is do think of all these levels when you're designing your questions. Okay, uh, I guess where we had left off is uh, we were looking at the principles of research and trying to answer or ask the question how we can apply each of these in, the, uh, in your own classes. And in fact, I will come, well, one of the points we've already talked about, learning is a social activity. We talked about incorporating some question, uh, we, we looked at some activities that we can do in a classroom. About the context and real life applications, I do have an example later. But let's spend a little bit of time on uh, the second bullet point, how, Sorry. what people uh, know already, how does that affect what they learn. And one thing you can do when you start off a new topic is to find out what people really know about a given topic. And if it's something very new or abstract, perhaps they haven't heard of it. But if you're talking about arrays, for example, most students who come to your college do know about arrays from their mathematics classes. And you can use the examples from maths to connect to arrays as a data structure. Once you have arrays, you can go to lists or you can go to the next data structure. So while planning your lesson, you have to think about what will follow or where these lessons will follow from at the general level. But also if you're, if you're not sure what your students know already, just ask them. They'll be very happy to answer. Um, regarding the first bullet point where students actively construct their own knowledge, let's, talk, let's do an activity just now and uh, talk about it. Okay, so this was exactly the question we wanted to ask. These are great theoretical points, but how can you apply them? So what I want to do is show you three examples and these examples I'm sure the coordinators are very familiar with. This is from middle school mathematics and just look at the three examples. The question I'm going to ask you talk to your neighbor to answer these questions is what is similar between these three examples and what is different. So let's uh, just look at all the three examples together. Three examples on graphing and slopes. Take a minute, answer the question what is similar and what is different. And what I want you to do is talk about the similarities and differences about these three. So let's just hear from a couple of centers. I put the two questions, the three questions back together again. Let's talk about similarities. Well, actually, you know what, let me just, similarity is just a one line answer. That all three have to do with the same topic. We're talking about straight lines and slopes and some graphing. So that all of us agree about. Differences are where it's interesting. And there's a point I'm getting to with these three questions. So let's hear from a couple of centers as to what you think are the differences. Okay, Anna University, please. Okay, the similarity is that they're all with slope. Hello. What's the difference? Hello. Yeah, the similarity is with slope. Yes, and the difference is? All the topics are regarding the slope. What are the differences in the three examples? Uh, the differences is... Uh, the third one is uh, regarding the calculation. That is, we have to evaluate the third one. Okay. And the first and second? Ma'am, actually the difference, the difference is, ma'am, that the third one, it is talking about the equation of the line. It is given and from that you have to find out the slope. 
where is another two the points are given and we have to find out the uh, slope okay so this point i'm sure all of you have noticed that there's a difference in the representation in the third example we have a representation of equation in the second one we have a graphical uh, pictorial representation and in the first one there is some numerical calculation involved but there is no visual representation so difference in representation is one main difference can you think of any other difference between the three examples periyar please i feel that all questions are uh, giving room for guess so the comment is that all questions might be might give room for guessing and would you like to clarify a little bit yeah that is there is a very possibility for the uh, person who is uh, answering these questions to choose any answer at random okay so let me just uh, answer this a little bit these three questions i ha we haven't yet discussed about where these questions yeah please go ahead okay ah uh, i feel that uh, multiple choice questions are always a uh, kind of uh, random in nature they give room for uh, guesses okay thank you for your comment yeah thanks for your comment and let let me address this comment a little bit the comment was that these all three are multiple choice questions that's the other similarity and it's always possible that when you have multiple choice questions there's room for guessing now while this is true we haven't yet discussed as to where we use these questions and you are right that if you if we give these question in exams there's always a possibility that somebody might guess now that's something we have we may have to live with but let's look at another place where we can use these questions where we are not using it for assessment in terms of giving the student a mark or a grade but using it for student learning now uh, let me go back to the three questions i'll talk about where to use these questions right in the next slide but going back to the three questions do you think that the three questions are all equal in terms of difficulty conceptual difficulty just think about it if you look at the first one seems to be a very straightforward application of an equation of the formula for slope given two points the second one again as we said is in a different representation but again the points are there and you have to calculate the slope knowing the points the third one on the other hand is a highly conceptual question and even if a student let's say a 6th or 7th standard student knows how to calculate a slope she might have to think a little bit more in terms of finding out which of these is different and which is similar to others so when you're designing questions you can have the same topic but different levels of questions and it will motivate different kinds of learners or it will motivate the same learner at different points in instruction so if it's the first time you're teaching slope you might just want to give a simple basic straightforward question but after having talked about slope for a few days you might want to give the third question where there is a lot of conceptual thinking going on another place where a question like number 3 is useful is in the class itself right after instruction and this is where the clickers really come into handy now let's do this with a live example and then we can come back to this question uh what we have here is uh next slide please i'm going to flash a question and i would like you to discuss this question in your group and then vote on the answer using the clicker ideally if you were in, if all of you had clickers what we would do is first do an individual round of voting where you did not talk to each other and then we would do the group voting but since we have only about 5 clickers for the entire set, uh, set of participants let's do it as a group to begin with so two or three people or three or four people to a group this is a question talk to each other and then i would like you to vote uh i'll just repeat the question the question is which of these expression evaluates to 21 in c++ language the first is 5 divided by 4 plus 20 second option is 3 3 star 1 plus 6 third option is 3 parenthesis 7 parenthesis close and the last option is none of the above 
now uh, I would request that uh, I think the coordinators would have already distributed the clickers among the participants. So I request each participant to press the start key, that is the ST key. Choose their responses out of A, B, C or D and then press the lock key. Uh, I request the coordinators to make sure that all the part participants have pressed in their responses and then they can press the collect response key. Uh, make sure they enter the quiz number 7 in the application. Uh, we have received responses from 6 centers. Uh, you can take another minute to send in your responses. Uh, yeah, I would request everyone to keep in their answers, you know, there is no penalty for wrong answers, so you don't have to worry about getting negative marks. I'll just repeat the question again. Which of these expressions evaluates to 21 in C++ language? The first option is 5 slash 4 plus 20. Second option is 3 star 1 plus 6. Third option is 3 parenthesis open, 7 parenthesis close. And the last option is none of the above. Okay, so while we are waiting for the responses to be collected, I'm sure all of you have uh, finished pressing your responses. I, I do, I want to see the responses. Uh, usually as a teacher, you have a few options at this point. Ideally, you would look at the distribution of responses and then decide how to proceed next. So one really useful benefit of this method is that as a teacher you get immediate feedback as to what the students are thinking and how they're, uh, uh, or what they've understood in a given topic. Before, so since I haven't seen the responses yet, I don't know what the distribution would be like, but I have a question for all of you. Okay, let's look at the responses. It seems to be ready. You all, all of them together. Bar chart or something. Okay, so looks like there is a distribution between A, C and D. And typically you would find some sort of distribution. Now, what I would like to point out is that even though this question comes from one of the earlier topics on data types in when you're teaching programming, it's still, po and maybe some of us might consider this question as a little boring. It's not a very exciting question. Yet, there could be differences in thinking among the different people, among the students and the learners. So it's very good feedback for the instructor that this topic may need some extra bit of discussion before we move on to the next topic. I have a question for all of you, even those of you who are, uh, all of you who voted different uh, responses. Did you change your response, or you might have thought of a response, and then did you change your response based on what you talked about uh, with your neighbors or with your group members. Think about that for a moment. And I don't have you in front of me, so I can't see you nodding. But typically what happens is some fraction of the people do change their response after discussion with their peers. And again, that's another very important benefit of this method, that students are learning from each other. They have an idea. They can change their idea. They convince their neighbor of their idea. They learn skills of scientific argumentation, etc. So let's look at uh, some other benefits and what this method, by the way, is called peer discussion. At this point, when you do this, the classroom can get very noisy. And in fact, that's a very good thing. As a teacher, don't be afraid of chaos in your classroom. Okay, next slide. So the this method has been shown to work really well in terms of student understanding and student learning gains. And some of the reasons are that students are very actively in, involved. And again, in your own centers, you might have noticed that you're talking to each other, trying to argue with your neighbor, trying to convince the other neighbor, etc. And about the principle that we talked about earlier, where people construct their own knowledge, when you're trying to figure something out, and especially when you're trying to teach something to somebody, there's a lot of learning happening. You're actively constructing knowledge. Nobody told you or a textbook did not tell you that these are the different data types and this is how it is. So when you have a question you're at and you're trying to answer it, it's you as a learner who are, who's trying to construct this knowledge and at the end of it, you'll come, you'll come out of it with knowing exactly what the different data types are and how they behave under different operations. 
Now, even though this is an, a fairly straightforward question, it keeps the interests of all kinds of students in class. Because if you already know what's going on, here's your chance to convince your friend. Or it's possible that you think you know what's going on and your neighbor convinces you that that may not be exactly the case. So it does hold the interest of all the learners. Some other benefits we talked about, there's feedback to the instructor. So at this point, I can take a call on whether I want to go back and discuss those answers or whether I want to move to the next topic or I just want to say this is the answer and this is why it's the answer. Usually we recommend some amount of discussion where the instructor, instead of saying this is the right answer, we have the instructor call upon a couple of students or a couple of groups and ask them why they voted the way they voted, did they change their answer, what made them change their answer and so on. Uh, many students realize that they're not the only ones struggling and that's good for their morale. And it builds a friendly atmosphere in class. The noise level always helps. But at the same time, students are learning skills of scientific argumentation. So this method has been used for over a decade in uh, physics, maths, biology, ecology, and so on. He, there are some references which, you, which will be made available, I mean, not the references, but the links will be made available to you once this slide, or these slides are put up online. Now, the other reason this is really important is that you will and you can contribute to a bank of these questions. So over 10 years in some of these topics, a huge database of these questions have been developed which instructors can use. And we are trying to do the same thing for CS101. So we're constructing this library and this is where your input comes in. So your next activity, next, next, is write one such question for any one topic in programming and we'll ask you to share your questions in a few minutes. Well, the other thing on this slide are some uh, features of good clicker questions. Typically, these are not very straightforward. They are conceptual. They are less numerical than conceptual. They are supposed to be used for in-class discussions, not really for graded quizzes. And here are some, uh, on the slide, there are some possible ways of constructing these questions. For example, you can give a code and ask students to predict the output, or you can ask students to apply something in a new context and so on. So let me leave you to write this question for a minute and then you can raise your hands when you're ready. Okay, so some of you have raised your hands and you want to share some question. Uh, let's look at AAC Amritapuri. Okay, so the qu clicker question again is about uh, the kinds of numbers. So if you have a s number like 3.5, what is the size of this? Is that your question? And your different choices are the 2, 4, 8 and so on. Okay, thank you. Any other center wants to respond with a question? Let's look at MG and Nanded. We have a clicker question. Please go ahead. The performance of a program is measured by, we have the options, option A, running time, B, compilation time, C, lines of code, and the D is uh, maintenance. Okay, again this would be a very good clicker question after you talked about, no thanks, I got the question. Let me just summarize this question. So when you're talking about uh, compilation and performance of a program, after you've done this topic, you can ask a question which says the performance of a program depends or is dependent on runtime, compilation time, lines of code, or all of the above. Now, in questions like this, uh, you really have to be prepared to get a distribution of responses. And you need to have some strategies at this point as to what you will do when you get different responses from different students. For example, if a lot of students have answered what you consider to be the incorrect response, then there's, you may have to go back and repeat that topic or you may have to directly address why that answer is not valid and wh what the actual valid answer is. Uh, so again, this is a conceptual question where you're getting students to think and talk with each other. Uh, let's look at another question from Amravati. Please go I ahead. I want to ask you a question or other. I'm going to tell you the question re related to the good clicker question as a conceptual. So, so the ability to take more than one form that can be asked as a clicker conceptual question where the forms are 
first is polymorphism, second inheritance, then data abstraction and data hiding. So these can be the question that can be asked as a good clicker question under conceptual. Okay, thank you. That was a conceptual clicker question. Let's hear one more. Uh, Nirma Ahmedabad. What is the functionality of the compiler? Find errors only? Find the error and uh, convert into the machine level? Or it will translate the programs? Oh, okay, thanks. So this question was about functionality of a compiler. Is it only to find errors? Is it to compile programs, etc.? So we are getting a series of good questions and I would very strongly urge you to keep to write these questions and email it to us and Professor Fatak might have mentioned in the morning that you still even after the workshop is over you still have work when you go back where you have to write questions, write syllabi etc. So along with your regular questions do include some of these clicker questions. The only one thing I want to make, a, uh, make note of here is that you can have problems in the clicker questions. They sh uh, well, I did say earlier that they need to be conceptual. And what I meant there is that don't put a problem where you have heavy computation in involved in the problem. But you can have numbers, you can have people um, deciding which is a better program than the other. You can ask about output of a program. You can ask why certain code may not work and things like that. It doesn't only have to be questions dealing with uh, definitions or, func or uh, functionalities. So there's a series of topics. In fact, any topic in any topic, you can write a conceptual, challenging, multiple choice question and use it for in-class discussion. OK, so please do keep writing these questions and you can mail it to us afterwards. Um, Let's take a moment here and summarize what we've done so far. And this slide, in fact, I'm putting it only at the end because it has a lot of technical jargon, technical words here. And these are some of the strategies that teachers use. And these strategies, again, have come out of experiments in classrooms as well as theoretical ideas by cognitive scientists. So let's go through these and see if we have actually touched upon any one of these. The first one there under behavioral is called interactive engagement. And what that means is that students are thinking, they're sometimes doing hands-on activities, but they're, they're always doing what they call minds-on activities. They're engaged with each other. So have we used any, have we uh, done any activity that promotes interactive engagement? That's something you want to think about. Peer discussion we already talked about. Collaboration, again, is when people work in groups, learn from each other. Under cognitive, we had multiple representations, which we briefly looked at when we had the question on graphs, that you can have the same kind of question, but in different representations. So this slide is meant more, for, more as homework for you. You can look at these and try to find out more about these techniques and try to come up with examples in your own topic in CS101 when you're uh, trying to plan your lesson. So these are really words that have flashed before you, and you can try to find more references for these. So before we go to some other strategies, let's do a little bit of summary at this point. That right in the beginning, we started asking the question as to what are our goals for teaching and what, how we can translate them into specific measurable learning objectives. And in fact, you took a few topics, you took arrays and some other topics and wrote learning objectives as to what you want students to be able to do at the end of the class or at the end of a lesson. We also talked a lot about classification of learning objectives in different uh, levels, hierarchy of learning objectives, which goes by the name of Bloom's taxonomy. And in fact, you did the very difficult task of writing, taking one topic, taking the same topic and writing questions at different depths in that topic. So we, we do want to emphasize that when you're looking at different levels of understanding, it doesn't mean that you have to keep including new content. You can keep the same content and ask questions where a student, where you can have a little bit of superficial knowledge recall or much deeper understanding. So we did a lot of examples of those. Uh, we also looked at some strategies that promote peer discussion, interactive engagement, active learning. And 
asking a clicker type question, in fact, is one of uh, the very robust ways to promote these, uh, these sort of uh, benefits. So let us look at a few more strategies. We will not spend too much time on these because uh, these are familiar to most of you as teachers. It is just putting everything together and as a wrap up, I thought it would be a good thing to have these. So we did talk about this aspect a little bit that when, uh, when you want to know what students know, since they do not they don't come in with previous experiences and previous knowledge, it is good to plan our lesson, it is good to think about students learning based on what they know. And again that goes back to the idea of learner centric rather than teacher centric. So one easy way of doing it is to really ask students. And another way, another strategy that some people use is to use analogies to build upon what people already know. So you can take a base domain in which it could be something from everyday life where uh, people know about a certain topic and then you can extend it to the technical topic using the ideas of analogy. A completely different thing and this is something we touched upon in the first slide is that different people could learn differently. And our own personal experience is not, a, not the best guide for it because in some ways we are all very similar to each other. We are all teaching the same topic, we are all college instructors. So our experience may not be the best way. Now, we don't have an answer as to what is the best way, but we have a series or an array of strategies in front of us and getting to know students and applying what works best for them is one way to address this idea that different people learn differently. We had also asked the question as to what do students want? What are their goals? And one thing students really like if you ask them is to learn things in, or to, to relate to topics that are interesting or exciting to them. So that's beca especially because of the generational gap that could become difficult occasionally. So we can talk to them, find out what's interesting and use that as a context to talk about some of our more abstract ideas. Uh, again, going off in a slightly different direction. When we have our learning objectives, th we want to think of beyond content. We do not want to be modeling problem solving skills, thinking abilities because those are as the skills and attitudes are as important as the content for us to teach them. And the final thing on this slide really is that whatever we do in the classroom, unless our assessment reflects it, people do not or learners will not take it seriously. So going back to the fact that students do not want to pass exams, they have to. So if our exams reflect authentic questions, if they reflect the skills and attitudes that we want them to learn, then they will automatically take that more seriously. So the final thing here is, uh, again I do not want to need to talk about this too much, but the last time I showed this slide to the coordinators, there was some very interesting discussion about how to make our teaching and learning more personal, how to let students know that we care. So perhaps we can just close this session by leaving this slide on and you can have a short discussion in your own session if you in your own centers if you want and you can talk to your uh, remote center coordinators as to what some of these ideas really mean. Uh, yeah, so if you want to share some of these with us you can again raise your hand. Take a few minutes, think about all that we did in the last three uh, hours. In fact, uh, there is another slide I want to leave you with. Okay. So this was the first slide that we began with as to what will be the roadmap for today. So I am going to repeat that first slide and leave, leave you with these questions. Have you been able to identify some strategies that you can use in your classrooms? Which ones did you like? So we can spend about 10 minutes or so taking your comments and questions and then we can wrap up today's session. If you have clicker questions, if you want to respond to that, please email it to us and we will keep putting it in our database. Right now, let us spend a few minutes just reflecting on what strategies you learnt and what you are going to use in your classrooms. Surat, SV, NIT, please go ahead. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I think uh, the best strategy that we have to use is that uh, whatever the topics we have to teach, we have to correlate those topics with our real-time examples and then we have to set some questions 
uh, and then we have to proceed for that because the real time uh, real time examples are it will be very near to the students and they can easily uh, interrelate themselves with those examples so i think uh, we have to use real time example maybe in the case of array maybe in the case of pointers structure everywhere we have to use the real time uh, examples so you want to focus okay thanks so you want to focus on real life examples even when you have very abstract concepts and real life examples that are very uh, that, that students can relate to yes definitely next center yes indar please go ahead uh, ma'am i want to ask uh, one question uh, what is a logical error in and, and explain the some kind of examples with logical error okay so if you have examples of actual questions again please email it and we'll put it in our library because we are constructing this big library there is going to be a clicker demo right after the session so please stay and uh, as soon as we wrap up the session which should be in a few minutes we will have a clicker demo please go ahead coap yes i can hear you uh, the uh, the technique i will that will be most useful is give the assignment on the existing knowledge of the student first for example you want to go to the looping statements first uh, give their assignment to write their print their name 10 times or 100 10 uh, times first okay they'll come up with an 10 print of statements then ask them to do it for 100 times then when once they'll know that there is a difficulty in doing that then introduce the next topic Okay, means first you. raise yeah. the question then introduce the topic okay thank you yeah so this is an interesting comment from coep pune that when you're trying to teach a new topic you actually try to you give an assignment to students where they realize what's the problem in the old way of doing something and only then introduce the new topic which might help make this process easier so yes that could be one of the strategies that we follow So um uh, what i would suggest at this point is that all your questions and comments do send us email and especially your questions uh and uh, we we will have a clicker demo at this point so thank you everyone